In the previous video for Chinese film classics, we talked about how the 1948 film Crows and Sparrows used the set of a multifamily apartment to create a compressed and dynamic narrative environment, as well as how it used the drama of a small community to create an allegory of the Chinese Civil War. In this video, we'll talk about how the film treats the villains, about its indeterminate ending, and about some of the historical ironies that emerged in the years following the film's release. Crows and Sparrows, as I mentioned in the last video, interweaves stories of dwelling and exodus. By winter of 1948, the Chinese Civil War had already turned decisively against the nationalists. The Huai Hai campaign, mentioned in the opening title card, lasted from November 6, 1948 to January 10, 1949, and brought the communist army to the northern banks of the Yangtze River. The title card actually gets slightly ahead of the historical chronology at this point. As the Nationalist Army was being routed, a white terror prevailed in major cities like Shanghai, with political assassinations and carpetbagging being carried out by Nationalist agents, by gangs, and by independent criminals. In the context of mid-century political films, Crows and Sparrows, like Spring River Flows East, is remarkable for the amount of screen time it devotes to the villains. Spring River offers an extended expose of wartime profiteering, particularly by industrialists who turn the nationalist temporary capital of Chongqing into a center of decadence. Crows, made two years later, targets not businessmen, but government representatives and institutions, focusing on one Nanjing official's work-life arrangements. Mr. Ho Yibo, the primary representative of the regime, is caricatured as a beast or an animal, but the settings and actings are on the whole somewhat naturalistic and the cinematography only occasionally lapses into bottom lighting and extreme close-up techniques that render him physically grotesque. Ho is a mid-ranking section chief, or kezhang, at the Ministry of Defense. The role is played by Li Tianji, the screenwriter of Fei Mu's Spring in a Small Town from 1948, and he had appeared in a buffoonish role in another film a couple years earlier. Less screen time in Crows and Sparrows is allotted to the slimy acting principle of the school at which Mr. Hua teaches, but both of these men are agents of corruption and violence. Ho's entrance is perhaps the most brilliant character introduction in Republican Chinese cinema. The camera focuses on Yu Xiaoying, attending to him as he lies off screen in bed, and we hear him clear his throat noisily. She hands him a handkerchief and a dish into which he noisily expectorates. During a later visit, we first see a framed portrait of Chiang Kai-shek, inscribed to Ho, and then a photographic portrait of Ho in uniform. The graphic match between the two photos suggesting that Ho emulates, or apes, the Generalissimo. We then see Ho's back, and then his reflection in the mirror in which he is adjusting his uniform. Only then does he face the viewer. The filmmakers thus reveal this vile character step by step. Ho Yibo begins as just an absence, we only hear his name but he progresses through layers of sonic and visual abstraction to become a corporeal presence. His jutting chin, his bulging eyes, his ready leer, and military rigidity are almost cartoonish, accentuated by the square uniform and multiple close-up shots. Ho himself is by no means a big shot in the Kuomintang hierarchy. His middling status is conveyed by the small size of his perch. He terrorizes only the sparrows of one apartment building but he symbolizes the thuggishness of the average nationalist official. Ho Yibo's name is a pun on Ho Yibo, unprincipled monkey. The Xiao children and Ah Mei up on the rooftop once chant a rhyme about him as being a grasping traitor. The film settles political scores using not only puns and mocking doggerel, but also mimicry and invective, as when Ba Xiao mimics Chiang Kai-shek and Mrs. Xiao curses the Hun Zhang Zhengfu, the bastard government that ruined her by mandating a rise in the price of gold. Yu Xiaoying is a handmaiden to villainy. Though a painted lady made up to the point of caricature, her character is part of the realist tableau of this Shanghai apartment. She too has a daily routine, much of which involves killing time with her maid during the indeterminate waits between visits by Mr. Ho. We are introduced to her in the very first scene of the film, with a close-up of her reading material, a pocket cartoon edition of Legend of White Snake, Bai She Zhuan, the type of disposable pulp entertainment reading material that flourished during the hyperinflation of the late 1940s. 
Ho treats her as equally cheap and expendable. She is utterly dependent on him for her livelihood, and she sticks with him despite her humiliation when he moves in on the beautiful Mrs. Hua. As a film about the final months of nationalist rule in China, the film exudes a fin de siècle aesthetics. But of what sort has been something of a matter of debate? At a 1957 film awards event, communist critics lauded the film as capturing the reality of the dark days before the dawn of liberation. Scholar Leo Li considers the film to be in a mode of socialist realism that focuses not on praising the new regime, but rather representing the negative conditions that led up to the revolution. Director Zheng Junli, writing about his own film a generation later, said that it succeeded only partially as a realistic record of the times. Ironically, Zheng criticized himself for presenting scenarios and characters who were too far removed from the orthodox models, rather than being more realistic. He criticized himself for focusing on the narrow-minded urbanites rather than workers or peasants, and for underrepresenting the centrality of the maid, Ah Mei, and Mr. Kong's spontaneous enthusiasm for the People's Liberation Army. Crows and Sparrows employs many stock melodramatic devices from the 1930s, such as the child's life-threatening illness. Here, however, the climactic crisis is quickly resolved thanks to the member of the apartment community with the very lowest status, Ah Mei, who takes back the exorbitantly expensive medicine from the villains. This healthy girl from the countryside is a prototype for many of the subsequent servant girl heroines, like Wu Qionghua in the Red Detachment of Women, who escapes from bondage to join the army. Ah Mei cheerfully agrees with Xiao that with Mr. Hogan, she faces a bright future of going back to till the land instead of working for someone else. In the 1950s, the author Eileen Zhang was to present this rosy picture of a better life in the countryside as a lie. In her novel The Rice Sprout Song, Yang Ge from 1955, Shanghai homemakers urge their maids to go back to the countryside of their own accord, since communist policy forbid employers from firing their domestic help. But they go back only to find starvation. While containing communist themes, Crows and Sparrows does not go so far as to advocate the abolition of private property. Property rights are asserted, not deplored, and in the end, Mr. Kong resumes his status as essentially a landlord. The capitalist system is left intact, with a benevolent patriarch presiding over a utopian domestic arrangement of multiple families. Speculation is shown to be ruinous, and kleptocracy is put to flight. Mr. Hua emerges from his ordeal of being tortured, physically broken, but stronger in spirit. He emerges as an intellectual with backbone. In the didactic finale, he sounds the note of warning. Though the big villains are gone, they must remain vigilant, because plenty of smaller villains remain. Yet, though only released for show, all of his comrades were executed, he has been cleansed of fear. Mr. Hua Jiezhi's very name could be interpreted as China the Purified, or Clean Up China. The film also shows the oldest and longest suffering member of the community overcome his habitual pessimism. At the Lunar New Year celebration, old Mr. Kong pastes up an old couplet on the doors to the building for the first time in years. He declares to his fellow residents, the new year is here, and a new society will be here soon. Mr. Hua echoes the sentiment. That's right, a new year is here, and a new society is coming. We need to change to a new way of thinking. We people from the old society have a lot of bad old habits. We need to replace the old with the new, and make a fresh start, and to do our best to be a new person. Self-consciously, then, the filmmakers imbue the intellectuals, Hua and Kong, with the moral authority of a class that has been purified by suffering and will contribute to the incipient new China. With a joyful clamor, the group heads back inside to celebrate, and the camera pans to show children playing with lanterns and sparklers in the street. In later films, such as The White-Haired Girl from 1950, the villain is isolated and overthrown. In Crows and Sparrows, he is only sent packing, not punished with mass justice. The film presents an atomized threat personified by an individual, Mr. Ho being represented in the film poster as a black bird of prey with formidable talons. In doing so, the film avoids the question of what recourse the weak have if many crows band together. The tenants have essentially won a war of attrition, the most effective action being to defy, to stall, 
and to let history run its course. As Mr. Hua notes, sounding a rather ominous refrain that was to crescendo during China's Cold War, spies are still out there. And spies cannot simply be outweighted. Other ironies arose in the years to come. Film historian Yi Man Wang notes that the house of a private property owner like Mr. Kong would have been collectivized for public use in 1952, and that peddlers like the Xiaos would have been phased out. In 1957, Crows and Sparrows received a bevy of state-sponsored film awards. Then, in 1958, amidst the Great Leap Forward, Mao Zedong announced a campaign to eliminate the four pests, Chu Si Hai, rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. The Kill the Sparrows movement, Xiao Mei Ma Xue Yun Dong, which lasted until 1960s and was replaced by a campaign against bedbugs, had millions of citizens harassing the birds by banging on pots and pans shooting them with slingshots and air guns, destroying their nests, and stealing their eggs. The near extinction of the birds, which eat more insects than grain, exacerbated the great famine that killed tens of millions of people. Then, a few years later, in 1969, filmmaker Zheng Junli died in jail as a political prisoner.